All right, welcome everyone to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours Hangout. My name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, where people can jump in and ask their questions around search. Um, lots of questions were already submitted on YouTube. But it also looks like we have a bunch of people with their hands raised, ready to go. So maybe we'll just go through some of those first. Let's see. Ibrahim, I think you're first. Um, I can't hear you. I, I think you're muted. OK, hello. OK. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. So we have three online pharmacies in Switzerland, Amavita, Coop Vitality, and Sonnestorp. You may have heard them. And uh, for Amavita, in summer, we got a lot of spammy backlinks. And I also talked with you about that. And from what I have uh, know already, usually Google can manage those type of backlinks. But after Google update, core update in July, we got really hurt in our visibility for Amavita, just specifically for that shop that we got spammy backlinks. Uh, I tried a lot to uh, disavow them by Google links, but uh, at the same time, Coop Vitality and Sun Store, we increased like double in traffic and visibility. But so I'm, I'm really not sure if this, this was because of just spammy back things. I assume that. So I would like to get your recommendation on, on that. What should I do? What can we do? We, we try to figure out things. We try to solve technical problems that we have, which we have. But so far, I still believe that happened because of spammy backlinks, but not sure. OK. Um, it's, it's hard for me to say w without digging into the detail. But uh, in, in general, with the uh, core updates, if you're seeing changes there, Usually, that's more related to trying to figure out what the relevance of a site is uh, overall and less related to, to things like spammy links. So that's something where I wouldn't expect any reaction from a, in a core update based on random spammy links that go to your website. Uh, and uh, also, with core updates, if like you, you can make incremental changes to improve your site over time uh, with regards to the overall quality. And that will incrementally help there. Uh, but if it was a really strong adjustment with a core update, then you probably need to wait until the next core update to see those changes. And because I don't think it would be related to the spammy backlinks, I, I don't think disavowing those backlinks would, would change anything there. It's, it's really a matter of us trying to figure out what, what the relevance of the site is overall. And that's something that almost relies on the overall site's quality. And I, I imagine it's tricky if you have multiple shops that are fairly similar uh, in that it's probably not the case that one of them is really bad and the other ones are, are really good. Uh, but it, it might still be something where you can use maybe user studies to figure out what, what are the differences, what are the things that you could do to make it clear that this site is, is particularly relevant. Um, and I, I think, especially with regards to websites like pharmacies, um, it is something where our algorithms probably try to be a little bit more critical just because it's, there's just so much more involved. It's not a random website that has a story and a funny picture. It's like people's health that's involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we need to work more on the uh, quality of the content, it seems, because we have kind of same content on all shops. Because of restriction, we cannot always change that. And also, we are solving and already solved a lot of 404 pages in sitemap. But thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I yeah, especially with regards to things like 404 pages and technical issues, that would not be related to core updates. Mm -hmm. uh, so core updates are really more about understanding your site's overall quality and its relevance, and less about technical issues and less about spam. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Nice. Good luck. Nice. Uh, let's see, Angie. Hi, John. Hi. Um, I have a question about JavaScript uh, SEO and getting JavaScript content indexed. So, um, so for Core Web Vitals, so I work on a blog um, website first of all, and uh, for Core Web Vitals, we so we have a feature where we put a YouTube um, video at the top, so that became the LCP element. So um, it was heavier than when we just had like a regular image. Um, so we're trying a method where we're dynamically injecting it. We're, we're, I saw a web dev article that su suggested lazy loading with a facade. Um, so since it's not below the fold content, we don't lazy, we don't la lazy load it, but we're using a facade and then the iframe is dynamically injected when the user clicks the play button. Um, I'm realizing now that the articles are not being indexed with the video content, um, on the page essentially. So if I search for the page and I go to video search, uh, it, it doesn't appear there. Um, I'm wondering what the best way to get that content indexed with the page is. I mean, I know I can do things like submit a video sitemap and stuff, but um, for it to be, for basically for the video to be seen as like related to the web page, um, the the way that it was indexed before. So is something like no script or structured data the way to go is is there any sort of best practice for this yeah D depending on the the way that you set up the kind kind of the the facade that you mentioned there where you you click on an image essentially or a div or something and then it loads the the video in the background uh, it can definitely be the case that we don't automatically pick it up as a video when we view the page and uh, I, I have had feedback from the video search team telling us, like, we shouldn't tell people to do this because it causes problems like that. Um, essentially, the, the best approaches there are at least to make sure that with structured data, we can tell that there is still a video there. Uh, so I, I believe there's a, a kind of structured data for specifically for videos that you can add. Um, uh, video sitemap is essentially very similar in that regard in that you're telling us on this page there is a video that is relevant. Uh, so those are kind of the, the two approaches there. I, I suspect over time the, the YouTube embed will get better and faster, and it'll be less of an issue where you have to kind of do these tricks. Uh, but I, I think for the moment, it can still make sense, and it can still have a big effect on, on the core web vitals of a page. So uh, from that point of view, I, I'm kind of torn. Like, if the video team tells me like you should put it directly, and the other team says like you should uh, make things fast, then like hard to find a middle ground. But I I think at least making sure that that we can recognize the video is there that's really important. Okay, so um, for the video object structured data, I think there's like a, a guideline, a general uh, structured data guideline that you can't mark up content that isn't visible on the page. So. Could it be potentially seen as um, misleading because Google can't actually see the video? I, I think that's fine. No, I, I don't think you have to worry about that. That's uh, specifically like if, if there were no actual video on the page, that would be a problem. And uh, specifically with text-based structured data, that's something we can try to figure out automatically. Uh, but when it comes to videos, th there are lots of different ways of embedding videos. And some of the ways to embed videos we just don't pick up automatically. And uh, because of that, we have the structured data. Uh, so from, from that point of view, that should be fine. OK. Um, and then uh, if, so I know there's a few different options here. So um, I wanted some clarification on the no script tag. Like, it, I know that's recommended for users who don't have JavaScript on. Um, how does Google handle that? Is it, and is it recommended to also include that um, just for when the page doesn't get rendered? We generally uh, ignore the content in the no script. Okay. Uh, so that's I, I, I don't think that would be a workaround if you're trying to include something for indexing. Um, so, so from that point of view, I, I would use the, the other methods more. OK. OK. Thank you so much. Cool. Um, let's see. I think Hazel was in between, but I don't know if you dropped your hand or if it just disappeared. Otherwise, 
we'll just move on. To I the think next. it was me, and I I accidentally dropped my hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I if I may. Sure, go for it, Sergio. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so I I have a question. I I'm testing with the plugin in WordPress that generates dynamic content, but then when you check the HTML code you actually don't see any of the words that we're trying to use within the text, within the subheadings. And I was wondering if Google would have a problem understanding what's, well, in the end shown to the to the end user. It's really nothing, there's nothing in the HTML code. It, it says something like um, just, you know, the, the tags, it says dynamic content, but you can't really read the words that we're actually showing to the user. So I'm not sure if that's also something that Google would be able to see in the end and we can perhaps rank for the keywords we want to rank for or what's what's going to happen there. I, I don't know that plugin. So it's it's hard for me to say. Um, one one thing you can do is... It's called If So. Just, just if, I don't know if you know it. No, I don't okay. Know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so many different things. Uh, yeah. So, so one thing you you can do is use the inspect URL tool in Search Console uh, to to check that page, and you can check the HTML there, and the HTML is based on on rendering. Uh, so when we kind of try to process the page like in a browser, mm -hmm. and if in the HTML you find the content that you want to have shown, then we we can we can index it. But if it's not in the inspect URL HTML, then we're not seeing the content. OK. Yeah, no, we're, then we're not, we're not going to succeed with that, I guess, because it's not showing really the words. OK. OK. OK, yeah. That, that's all Fantastic. I need to know. In that case, you Thank already you. had it figured out. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Tom. Hey, John. Um, super quick one from me. Um, I've sent a lot of applications to the book schema, rich snippet application tool, and we've done everything on our side to adhere to the documentation. Uh, I was on here like a couple of weeks ago asking if you could give the team a nudge to check that Google form. Um, I was just wondering if you'd had any time to do that or if you could do that. Which form? Uh, so basically, when you apply for book featured uh, like rich snippet um, on the schema documentation, there's a Google form to apply to have the website that you look after be included within that. And so you kind of like submit it and then nothing happens. And I just wondered if there was an internal team that looks after the application process or if that inbox is kind of just not checked. Uh, I was just kind of like wondering. We spoke about it like a couple of weeks back. Um, I, I don't know. Wh which type of structured data was that? It's a book. For books. I, I can check afterwards, but uh, usually I, I pass these on. Or if, if you can drop the details into the chat here, I can copy and paste it out and make sure that they, they have it. That'd be amazing. I'll drop it in the chat. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks. Um, David. Hey. Hey, John. Um, so I'm working on, um, actually, I'm a content creator that creates blog posts for um, for an e-commerce site. And we are selling like super um, technical products, like really it's, it's, it's metal profiles. And we have many different types of those profiles. And we have a lot of thin content because we have the same variations. Um, basically, if we have one U-shaped profile, for example, we have U-shaped profile in green, in red, and in blue, let's say. And then when we click green, red, and blue, which are all three URLs, different URLs, we have within this URL like thousands of variations and combinations and lengths and thicknesses and all that. And I'm I'm just I'm not. I was never, I don't know how to how to handle this because I don't know, like, should I canonicalize those? But then again, we're linking to them. So I don't want to like create bad in-links or whatever, or bad quality links inside of my page. Uh, or if I should, I don't know, no index or block from robots. I really, I really don't know. I don't have experience in that. Okay. Like, everything on the internet seems to be like very, like <laughs> nobody seems to agree. Um, and like some people handle it the, the one way and 
other people another way. So I'm not quite sure what the best thing to do is. And um, yeah, we don't need we don't need people to come to those variation pages. We don't want that. We just we just want to create good quality on the on the category pages. Okay, I I, I think you're kind of answering the question in in that case uh, because what. But usually what we recommend is if you have unique items that you want to have findable in a unique way, then you make sure that you have unique URLs for them. And you make sure that they're, they're canonical, they're, that they're not blocked by no index. Uh, but if you don't care about those individual URLs, if you care more about the, the higher level categories, or if you have something uh, like a, a broader product or category that essentially is, is the most important way of finding the content, then you can canonical to that page. You can no-index the other versions if you want. Uh, you, you can essentially do, do whatever you want there to kind of make it so that we focus all of our signals on that main page that you do care about. That, that's the question, because then I'm, I'm, again, asking myself, like, then I would be pointing to many no-index URLs within my page. That's fine. That's fine. Like if, if you link to those variations yeah. uh, and you don't want those variations findable, that's that's perfectly fine. Okay. And this is something where I, I suspect some of the confusion online is is just based on people having different opinions on what they consider to be important. Uh, so if you're selling yeah. shoes, then probably a specific shoe model is is the product that you care about. If you're selling shoes for maybe extremely large feet, then you want the shoe size to be also indexable. Um, so it's it's something where yeah. people have different I don't know priorities, and uh, you you can kind of pick and choose uh, wh what you want to care about, like. I don't know if you're selling a phone, you might have the different phone colors all on one phone product page. Uh, if you have one of those colors is gold and it's like super fancy, then maybe you want to have a separate gold page and just all the other colors together on one page. And like everyone does it a little bit differently. And I imagine with industrial products, like you mentioned, where you have like so many different dimensions and variations, it it probably makes sense to focus on kind of the general layout and say all of these different options are essentially an attribute of the main product, and we should just focus on the main product. OK. But if I would want to canonicalize, then I would have to basically have the same copy on the side to which I canonicalize. Like I would have to have the same, basically the same content on the, on the variation page. That, no, um, you, you don't need to. You don't need to have the same content. The, the thing to keep in mind with uh, setting a canonical is that we will try to index the canonical page that you mentioned. Uh, so if there's anything unique on the non-canonical pages, uh, then we wouldn't be able to find that. Uh, so essentially, anything that's critical, make sure it's also mentioned on the canonical page. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Christian. Yeah, hi. Hi, John. Um, this time I, I have a question uh, regarding um, Discover. Um, uh, in Discover, we have, yeah, we have uh, more or less two, two different, uh, let's say, search result pages. So we have the first page, and then you can click on more results, and then you have the second page. And um, my question is, um, is there any kind of ranking involved in this so that some article is on the second page or is it more a, a matter of, of uh, time or uh, current uh, or of, of the time when it is uh, updated or something um there is probably a sense of ranking but i don't think it's the same as traditional web ranking in that uh like it, discover is just so personalized so it's not it's not something where I, I think it would make sense to have kind of the traditional notion of, oh, you open a Discover page and you're number five, and, and then maybe next time you're number four or something like that. Uh, so there, there is a sense internally within the product of trying to figure out what is most important for you or most relevant for you now when you're browsing Discover. Um, but I, I don't think any of that is exposed externally. Uh, so it's, 
I don't know. It's it's basically a feed, uh, the way that I see it. It's like uh, keeps going. So th this would be kind of personal ranking, which only involves my my personal interests, or uh, are there other aspects like? let's say the the uh, strength or the popularity or anything else of a, of a website which uh, which would uh, also in uh, take effect on onto this ranking i don't know hmm. um, i i mean there there are lots of things that go into even kind of the, the personalized ranking side and uh, then i imagine there are also different aspects of maybe geo targeting and different formats of web pages more video or less video more images less images mm. um, but I, i honestly don't know what what specifically okay so the best way to to cope with it would be to follow the recommendations there are for uh, for being listed in discover which uh have been uh yeah published by google sometime yeah. before yeah yeah i i would follow those recommendations uh in particular watch out for the the aspects where we say don't do this or mm. th those kind of things um and i i would also look around externally on twitter there, there are a handful of people who are really almost like specialized on Discover. And they, they have some really cool ideas. They've written some good uh, blog posts on what they've seen, uh, the kind of content that works well on Discover, the kind of content that doesn't work well on Discover. Uh, I, I would definitely check th those kind of things out. But because it's such a personalized feed, it, from our point of view, it's not that you can kind of like work to improve your ranking in there, because it's not a keyword that people are searching for. It's kind of like, well, here's here's some th stuff for you that we think might be interesting. OK, cool. Thanks. Sure. Cool. Uh, let me jump to some of the submitted questions. And I'll get to, to all of you with, with raised hands as well later on, uh, but just to make sure that the submitted questions also get covered a little bit. Um, let's see, uh, a question regarding 301 redirects and cache control headers. Um, I know I should use 301 permanent redirects in order to pass page rank uh, the best and fastest way possible. However, our dev team doesn't like to implement 301s, uh, mainly because they're stored in browsers possibly forever. Uh, they say in case of a misconfigured redirect, people might not ever be able to lose the incorrect 301 redirect. Uh, so first question is, does Google store 301 redirects just the same as browsers seem to do? Um, we like the, the whole crawling and indexing system is essentially different from browsers in the sense uh, that uh, all of the, the network side of things, they're, they're optimized for different things. So in a browser, it makes a lot more sense to, to cache things, to cache things longer. Um, but uh, essentially, from our point of view on the crawling and indexing side, we, we have different ways of or different things we need to optimize for. So we, we don't treat crawling and indexing the same as a browser. It's, it's a bit weird in the sense that we render pages like a browser, uh, but the whole process of getting the content into our systems uh, is very different. And we, we, you see this sometimes when you render a page or when you see a page getting rendered and it uses really old JavaScript files just because we've been able to cache them for a while, um, it, which maybe on a browser wouldn't happen. Uh, but essentially, it's different. Um, so, And then the, the second question is, uh, will Google accept 301 redirects with cache control, no cache, or a time in the headers in order for us to get the best of both worlds? Yes. That's perfectly fine. If it's a 301 redirect, we treat it as a 301 redirect. It doesn't matter uh, what, what kind of cache headers you also add on top of them. Uh, so from, from that point of view, if this is a solution that works well for your dev team and for yourself, um, why not? I, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, the other thing is uh, 302 redirects might also be an option if, if that works better for your dev team. Uh, 302 redirects have a bad reputation among SEOs. 
which I, I think is incorrect uh, because they, they do work the same as normal redirects as well. Uh, it's not that they don't pass any page rank, anything like that. And if you have 302 redirects for the long run, we treat them exactly the same as 301 redirects anyway. Uh, so if, if you can't work out how it works with 301 redirects, maybe 302 redirects would be an option too. Um, a question regarding images. I have uh, portfolio style sites with pages each showing 10 to 30 thumbnails displayed in a gallery and in full size when clicked. Uh, depending on the CMS plugin used, the full size image is or is not included in the page HTML. Uh, so, for instance, we have a kitchen URL showing a portfolio. The plugin has a feature that you can load kitchen question mark image equals one, two, three, and it'll load exactly the same page, but JavaScript will open a full uh, size version of the image, providing a sort of unique URL for a page for that image. In reality, there's only one page containing the entire image set, and it's, set, uh, it's only JavaScript that is kind of making that work. Uh, do you advise in, on considering each image uh, having its own page? and listing it in a sitemap, or should I canonicalize them all to the main kitchen page and list only kitchen in the sitemap, as in reality, there's only one HTML page there? Uh, so I, in general, I, I would treat these as unique pages. If when the page is loaded and rendered in the browser, it shows something unique, uh, then it's a unique, unique page, even if that's done with JavaScript. So we do process JavaScript. You, you can test that with the Inspect URL tool, and you can double check to see what Google is actually seeing. Um, the, the one place where I would tend to say it's useful having a, a separate image landing page is if you care about image search. And uh, for image search, having, having something like a clean landing page where when a user enters a URL, they land on a page that has the image front and center maybe has some additional information for that image on the side, that is really useful because it's, it's something that our systems can recognize as being a good image landing page. And uh, whether or not you generate that with JavaScript or with the static HTML on the back end, that's more up to you. Um, but essentially, kind of the aspect of having a unique image landing page is something that, that really helps when it comes to image search. Um, because Otherwise, if we just have this portfolio page with like 30 small thumbnails on it, and someone was searching for an image, it's hard for us to say, well, you'll find the information you need on this big landing page with lots of images on it, because chances are the image is somewhere where they don't see it offhand, and they'd feel kind of confused if we sent them there after searching for that image. Uh, the, the thing with image search is that it's, it works kind of separate from normal web search, and not all sites care about it. It's not the case that if you have kind of good performance in image search that you will have better performance in web search. Uh, you can essentially treat these as separate things. And uh, from that point of view, if you only care about web search, if you don't really need these images to be visible in image search, then like, this might not be even be something that you need to, to care about. Uh, so I, I think those are kind of the, the different options there. Um, we run a small website with less than 200 URLs and perform a major redesign to a headless CMS to improve the quality of the user experience a few weeks ago. Our traffic and rankings have dropped significantly a few days later. How long will it take for Google to reassess the new design and return to previous search position? Uh, our URLs appear to be crawled post-update in Search Console. The migration used the same content, URL structure, metadata, and navigation, with only a few technical issues. For example, the H2 headers were not shown in the HTML, which may have caused some confusion, but which were resolved uh, two weeks later. Uh, so it's, it's hard to say what, what all was involved. But uh, in, in general, with bigger site relaunches, it is important to watch out that 
as much as possible. You can reuse the old things if you really want to kind of be seen as a new iteration of the old website. So using the same URLs, sounds like you're, you're doing that. Uh, things like internal linking, that they matter. Uh, the, the text on the pages, the headings, the, the overall structure of the pages, all of that matters a little bit as well. And uh, I, from just from uh, kind of looking through this question, because I don't know the website, my feeling is that there's more of a almost like a technical issue that's involved here that's causing these problems rather than uh, something subtle from the redesign that that you launched there. So especially if you're saying you have the same URLs and uh, the URL structure is the same, the text is mostly the same, and you're seeing a 60% drop in traffic from search, to me, that would point more at some kind of a, a foundational technical issue that maybe popped up uh, together with the redesign, which could be, I don't know, maybe we can't crawl your site at all anymore. Or maybe we can't reach your server properly. Or maybe uh, the, the hosting setup that you're now using is detecting Googlebot as, as a rogue bot and blocking Googlebot. Uh, those kind of things are, are elements that I would look at here. If this were a redesign where you just changed everything, new URL structure, you set up some redirects, and it's a completely different website, essentially, then I would expect this kind of a, a drop or a change. Uh, but if essentially everything is the same and small things have changed, then I, I wouldn't expect that big of a drop. And it would be more of a, a technical thing, I think. Um, let's see, second part of the question, if improving the quality of pages is important for Google with the page experience update, <laughs> why does it take Google so long to recognize these improvements? It seems counterintuitive for SEOs to commit to making a real difference to improve the web experience if they have to sacrifice losing search position and traffic for several months. Yeah, I, I, I think if, if you make a bigger change on your website, then like some, sometimes you do see fluctuations. Uh, but that's not something where we would say like those fluctuations are there because you improved your website. It's just we have to re-understand a website when you make really big changes across a website. Uh, but from, from my point of view, like a lot of the, the restructurings that you can do across a website, uh, depending on how you set them up, how you kind of execute on them, you can do that in a way that essentially has a very smooth transition when it comes to search, and uh, so that it doesn't like cause your whole website to disappear. Um, if if you're, I don't know, if you're seeing this or if you're here, I don't know, I, I don't see you offhand here, uh, but if you if you want to drop me a URL maybe on Twitter to double check, I'm happy to take a look. Uh, does having multiple pages not indexed due to quality affect the overall site crawlability? No. Uh, if you choose to no index pages, that does not affect how we crawl the rest of your website. The, the one exception here, of course, is for us to see a no index, we have to crawl that page first. Uh, so if, if there's something where you're creating, let's say, millions of pages and they're 90% of them are no index, and you have uh, 100 pages that are indexable, uh, and we have to crawl the whole website to discover those 100 pages. And obviously, we'll get kind of bogged down with crawling millions of pages. Uh, but uh, if you have, I don't know, a normal ratio of indexable to non-indexable pages uh, where we can essentially find the indexable pages very quickly, and there are some non-indexable pages on the edge, essentially. I, I don't see that causing any issue at all with regards to crawlability. And this is not something that is due to kind of quality reasons that like Google says, oh, no index pages are bad. It's purely a technical thing. Like if, if we have to crawl a million URLs, we have to crawl a million URLs to see what is there. It's not something where we can kind of like say, well, oh, we'll crawl only 50,000 because there's some no index pages. Essentially, it's, it's just a numbers issue. Um, we've heard that temporary 302 redirects don't pass page link equity. 
OK. Um, is our understanding of that accurate? More in general, we've heard that using 302s causes significant SEO issues, which has caused us to wonder if we should avoid these at all costs or if there are specific instances where we should use them. Uh, good question. Kind of similar to the, the previous one on redirects. And uh, the answer is a clear no. There is no negative SEO effect from 302 redirects. There, like the, I, I think the, the whole feeling of you lose page rank when you do 302 redirects, it is false. And uh, it, it comes up every now and then. Uh, I think the, the main reason why this comes up is because 302 redirects are, by definition, different in the sense that with a 301 redirect, you're changing the address, and you want Google systems to pick up the destination page. And with a 302 redirect, you're saying, well, this is temporarily somewhere else, but you want Google systems to keep the original URL. Uh, so if you're purely tracking ranking of individual URLs, then of course, a 301 will kind of cause the destination page to be indexed and ranking. And a 302 redirect will keep the original page indexed and ranking. But there's no loss of page rank or any signals assigned there. It's purely, well, which of these two URLs is actually indexed and shown in search? So sometimes 302 redirects are the right thing to do. Sometimes 301 redirects are the right thing to do. If we spot 302 redirects for a longer period of time where we think, well, maybe this isn't a temporary move, then we'll treat them as 301 redirects as well. Uh, but there's definitely no kind of hidden SEO benefit of using 301 redirects versus 302 redirects. They're just different things. Um, I, I hope you can help me with this. Is it normal for a URL to rank high on the first page for its chosen keyword? Uh, it can be found by searching the with a site query, yet it can't be found by doing a simple URL search in Google. Uh, I have lots of URLs like this across many sites, and I don't know if my sites are having any filter applied to them. Uh, so I, I think, first of all, if your pages are ranking for your keywords, then it's like it seems to be working right. So I wouldn't assume that anything is broken there. And it's, it's definitely the case that we try to recognize URL type queries and treat them a little bit like a site query. Uh, but it, ultimately, they're, they're different queries. And it can happen that uh, we, we don't show pages that we have indexed if someone specifically searches just for the URL itself uh, without doing something like a site query or an in-URL query. And uh, I, I would, in cases like this, just focus on, on the normal rankings that you see for the keywords that you do care about. Uh, because chances are your users are not searching for the URL itself, but rather for whatever keywords you happen to have on your pages or the content that you have there. Um, I noticed that previews in Publisher Center don't show thumbnails for WebP image formats. Uh, there seems to be little or no information on the web. Uh, since there is a constant urge to improve metrics and user experience, could you clarify if the format is currently supported or offer advice on adoption with regards to uh, Discover and Google News? Uh, so I, I don't know the details of what you're seeing in Publisher Center, so that's kind of hard for me to say. Uh, but uh, in our image processing systems, we support WebP images. And uh, we essentially use the same image processing system across the different parts of search. Uh, so my feeling is it would be really unexpected if any of these related parts of search were to treat WebP images in any other way than just normal images. Uh, so my guess is that maybe the preview you're seeing in Publisher Center is just not representative of what we actually show in search. Uh, a simple way to double check would be to, to see what these pages show, show up as in search directly. And if they look, look OK to you there, then probably it's just a bug in Publisher Center. Uh, what, what I would do here, though, is pass that feedback on to the Publisher Center team. Uh, I don't know Publisher Center, uh, but most of our tools have feedback sections where you can submit feedback, and I, I would use that there. And if you're seeing that 
this is some, something really weird and that in some of the search surfaces it works and some it doesn't, then feel free to also send me some examples. And I can pass that on to the teams here uh, internally as well. Um, let's see, another redirect question, I think. Uh, I work with a developer who is merging two sites for a mutual client. Uh, I would like to see site A redeveloped to include valuable content from site B, and then specific 301s from site B to site A, with site B remaining hosted until I see the re-indexing. Uh, this can't happen due to some XML feeds that need to remain. What is going to happen is site B is going to have content from site A added to it, and then renamed to the site A domain. And redirects will be added at a domain level. So site, oh, this is complicated. Uh, site B will actually be replaced with site A and no longer exist. So my question, is there any difference between keeping site B hosted with 301 redirects versus renaming site B to become site A? Uh, is that confusing? Yes. Um, to me, it feels like a bad idea, but I can't find anything specifically talking about the difference uh, between having content hosted and 301-ing versus redirecting the domain and there being no actual website files anymore. Um, so I, I, th I think there are the two aspects uh, just kind of briefly to mention. On the one hand, uh, when, when you're doing any kind of a site move or migration like this, usually I recommend either going incrementally in the direction that you want to head or doing the whole move all at once. Uh, in this case, it sounds like you're going incrementally first in the opposite direction, like moving everything to site B and then moving everything back to site A. And that kind of back and forth move, I. I think can make it harder for our systems to, to follow and to understand what you're trying to do. So as much as possible, I would try to find a way to do that in one step or find a way to kind of incrementally move things from site B to site A uh, and then build the new structure directly on site A uh, incrementally. That's kind of the, the first thing. Uh, the other thing with regards to redirects or just hosting everything on, on the new site, my suspicion is it's exactly the same thing uh, from, from a kind of an external point of view in that we'll see the redirects going from one place to the other. And uh, the, the practical thing that you might be seeing is maybe the content itself is just hosted in this one directory on the server or on the other directory in the server. And it's more a matter of how you technically host it on your side, uh, which is different. And uh, what people actually see externally, search engines as well, is probably exactly the same. Uh, so probably those two options of redirecting site B to site A or hosting site B on site A, uh, probably those two options are exactly the same. Uh, so hopefully that helps a little bit there. All right, let's jump back to some more live questions uh, in the meantime. Uh, Mihai. So many mute buttons. Uh, yeah. Hey, Sorry. John. <laughs> <laughs> so stressful. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I do have a couple of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll try to stop if, if there's too many and maybe uh, ask a few more afterwards. Uh, so a few of them are, are related to one of the topic of one of the previous questions regarding multiple versions of, uh, of a given product uh, and uh, canonicalizing it. Uh, so I, I'm curious, you know, in cases where you have like unique products, but the only difference is a very slight variation. So there's literally the same content on every page and that maybe the image or the color or something like that is, is different, but not something that people would actually search for. Uh, however, let's say you have like 10 products, products and eight of them you, you canonicalize. Uh, would that mean that Google only sees like a category with two products and maybe figure out that, well, this category only has two products. Maybe we won't rank it as well versus other sites that maybe have more. I, I don't think that would be bad. Like, I, okay. I don't think the, the number of products in a category page 
is is a ranking factor from from that point of view. So I I wouldn't see that problematic. Also on a category page, uh, even if you have only two pages that are indexable that are linked from there, you still have things like the thumbnails and kind of product descriptions and things like that that are also listed on the category page. Uh, so sure. kind of having yeah. the category page with 10 products and only two of them are indexable, I, I don't see that as being problematic. OK, so there's no reason to or for Google to think this page is kind of thin uh, in value or no, I mean, because it has the all of the information there. Like ma sure, maybe yeah. the links essentially lead back to the same pages, but you have information on this page about different different products that fit into that category. Uh, and so in terms of maybe internal linking, uh, would that make any difference? Like maybe on the product pages, you have breadcrumbs that lead back to the category page. Uh, with the canonicalizing so many products, uh, would that make an impact, or is basically sums up to the same result? I I suspect it's probably all the same. Yeah. It's probably all the same, yeah. right? Uh, okay. Uh, one more question regarding this uh, scenario is: um, if you have like eight variations of that product, all of them canonicalized to one of them, uh, but that one of them. Uh, that's the canonical version gets out of stock but you do have the other ones that are in stock would it be okay to move the canonical to one of the product that's in stock sure sure i mean you can you can change canonicals over time i i suspect what would happen here is that it takes a while for our systems to recognize that uh, because mm -hmm. you're you're okay. changing the rel canonical and our systems generally try to keep the canonical stable. So mm -hmm. it's, especially we want to avoid a situation that we're like fluctuating between two URLs as canonicals just because the signals are kind of similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably there will be some latency involved in switching over. Uh, but that's that's something you can definitely do. OK. Um, yeah, I have a few more questions, but I, I'll just leave it uh, to, to uh, okay. the other people with their hands up. We, we have more time afterwards as well. Sure. So we'll Sounds see. Good. Cool. Uh, Johannes. Hi, John. It's nice Hi. seeing you. Um, nice to uh, uh, the, that I can talk about one problem I have with a client. Um, it's like, I think, a standard problem. It's um, many URLs blocked by robots.txt. Also, they have a HTTP header that is set on no index. So I said open the robots.txt so the URLs can be de-indexed. But um, the client is afraid that the server won't proceed all the requests and will fail. So I said, well, just um, if you see the user agent is a bot, you can just uh, give out a blank um, HTML body or maybe another kind of page. So. My question is, like, um, is there any risk of getting penalized because of cloaking if the HTTP header um, is set to no index? No, I, I don't see any problem with that. Uh, so in particular, if you're showing search engines less than you would show users, then that's, that's less of an issue with regards to cloaking. Uh, so the, the, the part of cloaking that is, is more problematic for us is if you so show us like a really big and interesting page, and when users get there, they see something really tiny or slightly different. Uh, but if you're showing us essentially an empty page and saying, oh, there's nothing here, you shouldn't index this page, and we drop it out of the index, then like we don't care if users see something else. Uh, because from our point of view, what we want to avoid is that we promise users something that they can't find. Uh, so if we drop a page from our index, we can't recommend that page because we don't have it anymore. Uh, but kind of the other way around, if we recommended a page to people for a specific query and they go there and they can't find that content, then they're frustrated and they think like we did a bad job. And that's something where kind of our cloaking problem comes from. Uh, but showing less is, is perfectly fine. OK, that's a good argument because in this case, like the whole URL amount of URLs are like duplicated and um, yeah, it's like a few hundreds yeah. of thousands. So yeah, I will. Um, thank you a lot for cool. Thanks. 
uh, Stefano. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, you're based in Switzerland. You should know this Stefano, not Stefano, but it's okay. Everyone uh, abroad calls me Stefano. I don't, I don't know why Stefano, by the way. <laughs> it's okay. Um, my question today is uh, related. I go back uh, to the first question uh, they asked today. Uh, it's about uh, the, the spammy backlink. Um, so I noticed I'm I'm noticing this period I'm use I'm using one of the Google tools uh, for us uh, and uh, I'm using uh, Google alerts that gives me some tips about who is talking about uh, our, our uh, websites um, and let's see uh, I'm seeing uh, uh, a lot of URLs coming from um, kind of uh, uh, AI generated the content, um, but uh, those those sites are not listed, uh, are not indexed in Google. Um, are clearly uh, uh, fake sites, uh, so it's okay. Google don't see them. I don't see them uh, in um, in SEMrush or in href or in href. So the only um, the only uh, point where I see those link is in, is in uh, Google Alert. So I'm um, I'm a little bit uh, worried uh, why I get this type of information from Google and then this site uh, is clearly not relevant. And uh, this took me to another uh, uh, thinking uh, that is about the uh, the use of. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence, especially, especially in Google, uh, with, a, with the raising of the MAM technologies and all this kind of stuff, uh, we're seeing uh, um, a lot of uh, black hat CEOs and uh, some sites using uh, uh, artificial intelligence generated content uh, to try to trick the, the Google algorithm. I know probably you are uh, aware of this, uh, and I'm curious about you know how are you dealing with this, uh, and what can we do uh, to stay out of all of this uh, spammy backlink? Yeah, good point. So I I think the the first one with regards to Google Alerts is Google Alerts. Like I, I, I don't know, know the Google Alerts team directly, so it's, it, this is just purely based on, on my observations. Uh, it, it's essentially trying to find content as quickly as possible and alert you of that. And uh, because of that, my, my assumption is that uh, it picks up things that we see for search before we do all of the complete spam filtering. And uh, because of that, we, we can send out alerts for things where actually when we take a second look for indexing, we say, oh, this is, this is junk. We can get rid of it. And I, I see that with, with alerts as well. So I, I have a variety of Google alerts that, that I'm kind of subscribed to just to see what is happening. And some, sometimes the alerts are just really spammy and weird. And I. I suspect that's something that the Google Alerts team can work on, but I wouldn't see that as an issue with regards to search. Uh, so if, if they're not being indexed, if they don't show up in, in the other tools, I would just ignore them. So that's, that's kind of the, the one thing with regards to automatically generated content. I, I feel like this is a topic that has actually been around for a really long time um, because it's like they're have just been so many different ways of generating content automatically. And uh, some of it is used in, in useful ways, and some of it is used in really spammy ways. Um, I've, I've made test sites with auto-generated content for, I don't know, since before I joined Google. Uh, what was that, maybe, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago? Um, and it's something where like these technologies exist, and people will use them, and search engines will index some of that content. But for the most part, we'll look at it and say, oh, this is really low quality content. And we'll see that these pages don't collect signals the way that normal pages do. And because of that, we'll basically say, oh, well, we'll, we'll kind of ignore this. And if 
for, from our guidelines, it, it is the case that if it's automatically generated content, it should be blocked by robots, for example. Uh, but my, my feeling is, at some point, that is going to shift a little bit in the sense that we'll focus more on the quality rather than how it was generated. And uh, that's something where I, I could imagine that there, there might be some setups for automatically generated content where you can actually create something that is fairly useful, uh, where um, based on maybe the input data that comes in, it's actually something that is useful for people. Uh, so I, I know, for example, I, I think in the US, uh, some, some of the uh, news sites uh, use feeds from um, the different, I don't know, geological institutes for earthquake detection. And they will automatically generate a news article if they see that one of these feeds says, oh, there was an earthquake in this big city. And uh, they will take this automatically generated content and publish it initially, because it's like, as soon as possible, get the information out there. Uh, but they'll also have people who go in and actually create something useful on top of that. Uh, so some mix of maybe automatically generated content and human curated content, I imagine, will, will become normal. Uh, but we'll continue to have the, the really low effort automatically generated content as well, where people just say, oh, I want to target this keywords. Give me five paragraphs of text and make it look like it's written in English. And you, like a normal person looks at it and reads through it and says, this doesn't make much sense, or these sentences don't fit together. And this kind of low effort content I, I think will continue to be something that our systems will try to recognize as low quality, maybe spam, and treat appropriately. And in the end, if it's low quality content, it doesn't matter if it was written by a person or by a machine. It's like it's not that useful for people. Okay, thank you. It's clear, and it's interesting that you said that maybe uh, one day uh, we will treat. Uh, Computer-generated content even more important than human uh, content. But, I I don't think more important. Uh, no, no, but it can but it can be. Uh, it it, it works yeah. together. I I think, and and I I think those are the the things that some people are working on. Kind of this combination of using these tools to create something new, uh, and I. I totally expect that people come up with something or some combination that's really useful. Uh, similar to, I don't know, you have a spreadsheet in, in, your, in your browser nowadays. And if you want to create graphs, like you could put the numbers there and it makes the graphs for you. Maybe at some point, if you have a system that helps you with writing, you, you start your sentences off and it helps you finish them up or it watches out for connectivity issues uh, that it's it's consistent what you're writing, or the style is the same, uh, all of these things. So using it as a tool, I think there are definitely lots of uh, uses for that. OK, that's clear. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, maybe I'll just take Michael, uh, and then we can pause the recording. I We'll see how long your question is. I'll speak as fast as I can. <laughs> So I, I was talking to a fairly well-known news outlet yesterday, and, and they were concerned their articles don't surface anywhere or anywhere meaningful in news. And I should note that I don't have a vested interest in this company, but I can say objectively their articles were nicely reported, fairly robust, high quality. But what was glaring was their over-monetization with ads. So um, there are many ranking factors, and typically it isn't one thing that dooms a site, but is it possible that that frankly, very poor user experience is materially hurting that outlet from ranking in news? Um, it's, it's hard to say, but it, it could have an effect. And maybe it's, it's enough that it's, it's a visible effect. Uh, so in, in particular, uh, within the page experience algorithm, we, we have the notion of kind of the above the, the fold content. And if all of that is ads, and then I could imagine that it's it's hard for our systems to say, well, actually, this is useful content. And especially with regards to news content, when it's topics that that are very, I don't know, commoditized in that there are different outlets reporting on the same issue, uh, then I could imagine that something like that pushes our systems over the edge. And if it's across the site, like on a bigger scale, I, I could imagine that, that we end up picking that up. 
it's hard to say like how much of an effect you should see there, but I, I could imagine there is some. I mean, everything else really objectively looked great, but it was one of those things where it was like, where's Waldo, meaning where's the content? Because there were it was just so cluttered with ads and you know, you, you just want to go crazy and say, please, with ads, sometimes less is more. And the fewer ads will actually convert to more traffic and revenue from the other things that I'm sure they're concerned about. So I felt like that was really, everything else was really, really good. Um, it was kind of disheartening to see them hurting themselves that way. Yeah, yeah, hard to say. Yeah. Cool. May, may I just, may I just uh, pop in here? Sure. Michael, when, when it's so many ads, have you checked the, the Core Web Vitals? I think the page could be very heavy and loading very slowly, something like that, probably. Right. So all of that was cascading. Not only was it so many ads, but obviously it was slow because of all those ads. Yeah. All right. Cool. OK, let me pause here uh, for, for the recording. I have more time afterwards. So all of you with your raised hands will hopefully get through and get your questions in as well. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to join us for one of the future sessions or drop your questions in the next Office Hours one. Um, usually, I open them up a couple of days uh, before we go live. So you can add your questions to YouTube in the community section. All right, with that. Thank you for watching, and maybe see you all next time.